welcome to the Metaphysics of Media Lecture. Um, tonight, the Communication Department is hosting Dr. Peter Fallon, um, Associate Professor of Journalism at Roosevelt University in Chicago. He's a 22-year veteran of the television industry and uh, the son of an Irish immigrant. Dr. Fallon studied media theory and criticism under Neil Postman and uh, in the Media Ecology Program at NYU. He's the winner of the Marshall McLuhan Award for his book, uh, Printing, Literacy, and Education in the 18th Century Ireland, Why the Irish Speak English, and also his current book, uh, The Metaphysics of Media Toward an End to Postmodern Cynicism and the Construction of Virtuous Reality, which a lot of us are reading. Um, he lives in Elmwood Park, Illinois, with his wife, Mary Pat, and we're glad he can join us tonight. Afterwards, there'll be some time for questions and answers, so keep that in mind. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, and where did Steve go? And Steve, and all the students uh, who I got to meet today for uh, being wonderful hosts. I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Ken Chase, who's not here. I understand there's a play tonight or something. And of course, uh, Dr. Reed uh, Shushart, a man uh, uh, becoming uh, known frighteningly large number of people in the world as daddy. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear, he had another child this morning. And as we Irish Catholics say, mazel tov. <laughs> I, I became interested uh, in this project in uh, the year 2000. That's a long time ago, I know. And I began working on an idea that really had been inspired by something I learned in the Media Ecology pro uh, Program at New York University. And those of you who, raise your hand if you're in Dr. Shushart's class. You probably have Media Ecology coming out of your ears. But for those few of you who don't know what it is, it, uh, it's, it's a, a perspective that looks at cultures as information environments and communication technologies as essential parts of a culture. By technology, we mean any artificial construct created by human ingenuity. And so this would not only include uh, digital media like the internet, electronic media like radio and television, and mechanical media like print, but also something as simple as speech. Systems of meaningful, conventional, oral symbols. Every single utterance we make invented at some point by human beings. In an early class, way back in 1986, a seminar in media ecology, my cohort and I learned a set of six principles regarding the operation of media and their consequences for the user. That these principles were derived from empirical observation and critical theory over several decades. These principles told us to be concerned with both a medium's physical form, or its hardware, and its symbolic form, the code used to transfer information from sender to receiver. It told us to examine a medium's symbolic form to determine whether it structures, whether it structures information propositionally through words or presentationally through still and moving images, uh, nonverbal cues, music and sounds, and that sort of thing. It told us to examine a medium's uh, conditions of attendance, the set of circumstances that confront us, whether we are aware of those circumstances or not, whenever we choose to use a medium. Uh, there were several others, but, but there was one missing, I soon found out, from a, a member of an earlier cohort. These folks, in their first semester, were handed a sheet listing seven principles rather than six. One disappeared. And I was curious why. And this principle said, because of the differences in their physical and symbolic forms, different media present the user with different metaphysical biases. And my antenna went up like that. Somehow this principle, by the, between the time that cohort entered and mine had entered, had fallen into disrepute. Most likely because it's difficult to ever talk about metaphysical issues and maintain your credentials as a scientist. I resolved that I would eventually uh, attempt to reclaim this principle's legitimacy and make a case for it as an appropriate focus of scholarly inquiry. And I'm going to let you in on a secret. Uh, I don't know if I succeeded. 
I hope I did. I answered all the questions that I was looking for. But I thought about these questions over the last 10 years, and I'm here today to share with you some of those thoughts. What kind of a world are we living in? You don't have to answer that right now. That is essentially a metaphysical question. Because that question assumes a different kind of world than the one we're living in. And if we're living in a kind of a world, but would prefer B kind of a world, what's stopping us from changing A to B? But we don't really recognize the metaphysical nature of this question. Because I think we've fooled ourselves into thinking that we are no longer metaphysical creatures. That we have somehow evolved to a point where we rightly believe only in a material reality. Uh, to be sure, to quote someone, I can't remember, we're living in a material world. And I am a material girl. <laughs> That's what she said, anyway. Uh, but we can't even seem to agree on the nature of that world, let alone any transcendent world. How many times have you heard this? You have your truth, and I have mine. I've heard my students say that, but, but I've also heard my faculty colleagues say that. There is no objective truth, they tell me. But the question of why two people can imagine for themselves two different diametrically opposed realities shows us exactly why the question of metaphysics won't go away. We can make jokes about metaphysics, uh, we can <coughs> ridicule it, we can wish it into the cornfield, but it's still there. Whether we're talking about a belief in God, or in ghosts, or spirits, or UFOs, or WMDs that aren't there, we're talking metaphysics. And the fact that at this moment in human history, there are people who believe in God, and people who believe in ghosts, and people who believe in UFOs, and people who believe that somewhere, somewhere, perhaps over the rainbow, there are weapons of mass destruction, and that all those divergent opinions are given the same credence, I think these are all symptomatic of our age, our worldview, and our postmodern condition. At the risk of oversimplifying a profoundly complex and important human cultural phenomenon, I think it's important to say that the mindset we call postmodernism represents, I believe, a great turning inwards towards subjectivity and uncertainty about anything except one's own strongly held beliefs. While I, I have been reading various postmodern theories for the last three decades, I think it, and by the way, I should say that I find many of them to be very helpful and productive, uh, and even positive. I still don't think I ever really uh, 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 it, I allowed it to hit me how unfortunate and potentially dangerous the worldview that has grown out and flowed out of postmodern is for what we once called civilized society, until very recently. And I want to share a couple of stories out of many in my personal experience that illustrate the type of danger, subtle but serious 